website. So thanks for joining us. I'd now like to turn it over without further ado to Dr. Wayne Secord. Hello, everyone. Well, I tell you, this is just a pleasure today to do this. And as you can see um, on the screen, there's a picture of the Elizabeth Wake and myself. Elizabeth is the first author of all the things that we work on. And I call her personally the boss because she is a tremendous leader who has taken us down the road to classroom success and just has worked with us in so many ways. And so I'm just proud to be her co-author. But today, today, I'm going to be doing the presentation all day. And, uh, you know, and this is one of the uh, workshops that I just enjoy doing because um, we try to get down into some of the really practical things of how all this works. So I'll try not to do a lot of reading of the slides. So sometimes I do have to read the slides because uh, just to make it practical. But otherwise, uh, let's move on, okay? So okay, there's a couple of things according to ASHA standards. We must um, disclose any personal, financial, or um, a other things about this, my relationship with everything. Obviously, as a, I have financial relationship with uh, the publisher Pearson, and I'm the co-author of the Self 5 Test of Metalinguistics, and I do receive a royalty from the sale of this test. I have no other real non-financial things, but you know, like today we will mention Cell 5 metalinguistics and Cell 5 itself, and uh, some instruments like that. And uh, again, I need to disclose that I do receive some income for that, and uh, I'm, I'm not here to sell that. I'm here to sell the good practice that you need every day. So, of course, content will mainly focus on the Cell 5 metalinguistics and secondarily on Cell 5. Okay, so let's begin to do some general language assessment questions, all right? And um, here's the thing that we usually do, and these things are often based around the standardized assessments. So um, just take a look at how self five fits into this. You know, we ask the question, is there a language disorder? Well, with self, we use the core language score to make that first decision. That is the, the absolute perfect function of that score. What's the, then we look into what's the nature of the disorder. Is it receptive or expressive? Is it, does it have to do with listening or speaking or reading and writing? Is, is it specifically syntactical or morphological or semantic? Um, does it interact with language and memory? And most of all, and more recently, how related is this language disorder to a child's meta-linguistic competence, the ability to think with the language system and manipulate it. And so we do have composite scores. We have lots of index scores and modality scores and things that are on a linguistic basis and memory interfaces and stuff like that on different assessments. And of course, then we want to know for language assessment questions, what are the language strengths and weaknesses? And we often profile the, um, and you'll see that today, the subtests that are given and look at strengths and weaknesses of them. So um, let's move on. The clinical perspective. Questions, is there a language disorder and how do we make that decision? I think you all will make, we, we, need it. we can go through this pretty quickly because you all know you, you, lose, you use primarily total language scores, receptive, expressive, modality-based scores. and. Uh, you, what's the nature of the disorder? You use things, you try to find language strengths and weakness. And those language strengths and weaknesses, uh, the con they are in content or syntax or morphology, semantics, language and memory, or metalinguistics. What's the nature? Where is the, 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 the focus of what this disorder is about? How is a student's performance going to compare to that of his peers, that's one of the things you make in your diagnostic decision, is where does he compare with other kids in the normal range? And finally, of course, what uh, you have to do is does the student's clinical performance profile meet the criteria in your state or school district for eligibility for speech and language services? The educational perspective is another one that's very, very important. 
and those are, of course, what aspects of communication in context are compromised. We're going to talk a lot about that today, such as uh, pragmatics and nonverbal communication. What aspects of academic performance are compromised? What aspects of listening, speaking, reading, writing, and the meta properties? We often say, in a sense, if we practically talk about this, we talk about what are the things that he struggles to do, say, make, and use in school. And you do that also by looking at what curriculum objectives are compromised, English, language arts, social studies, all the sciences, and all the math areas of phys ed and all the arts and all that stuff. So what are the curriculum objectives that are compromised? And then which are the students, what are the students' strengths, weaknesses, and learning adjustments? And what, we'll talk a little bit more about what we mean by learning adjustments later on. What does he do to, to adjust to the fact that he is or is not learning? Then the social perspective is obviously a very important one. What aspects of social communication are compromised? And we all know that that has to do with social communication with pragmatics, um, perspective taking, and nonverbal communication. What aspects of peer relations are compromised? Play or game activities, friendships, peer interactions, interactive sharing or participating in conversations or discussions. And just think of the meta properties that influence that as well. What aspects of student and adult relationships are compromised? Respect, following directions, behavioral management, executive, <coughs> mutual respect, trust, etc. And then what areas of social communication actually represent strengths? Then one that we work very closely with our school psychologists on are exactly what brain behavior things. What are the cognitive considerations? And especially we as speech language pathologists are starting to get more and more into the executive functions and working memory. And you will hear today that how much, just think how much the meta-linguistics, the ability to think about what you're doing, manipulate it, I tried it this way. No, it didn't work, but I tried it this way, and it did work. And where I, I used this, I tried this because I've done this before, the working memory properties of everything. This is the cognitive perspective is really a critical one, and we as speech-language pathologists need to get on this highway more often. So I love... Frankly, I love this slide, so I don't, I'm not going to try to stay on it forever, but I just love it. I just love it. If we, we try to just practically, let's just ask the practical question. But when it comes to language disorders, what are the intrapersonal variables that are active, and what are the interpersonal variables? What are, what's important? And we look at categor categories of intrapersonal there's language or linguistic-based ones. There's brain, behavior, or cognitive ones. And there are emotional ones in intrapersonal. And so, and of course, in linguistic, we're well aware of semantic, syntactic, and pragmatic aspects. But in terms of the brain and cognitive issues, there is absolutely executive functions, memory and working memory, and reasoning and problem solving. And then, of course, the having staying in emotional control, self-awareness, self-regulation in your personality type and maintaining the type of personnel that's a learning, that has a learning effect. And then, of course, there's with all those intra things, the things that are attacking, attacking inside, how about the stuff that are outside that are the intra-personal variables about language disorders? And they are things that we know happen in school, they happen in the curriculum. They happen in society. And so when I say school, you know, the school environment, school interactions, the school culture, and how well a child fits into it. And again, the meta properties really influence a lot of this. 
And of course, the curriculum. What grade level? What are the curriculum objectives? What are the specific learning outcomes that are real problems? And then how does all of this really affect and impact a child's or a person's behavior in society, in their culture, in the rules and functions that they play in society, or the various settings of the society? I love this slide. And I've had many times where I've given workshops across the country and I've used this slide. I've had so many people like it and want to comment on it. So uh, well, I want to, but this is Elizabeth's baby right here. So I want to brag on it for her too, okay? So let's, let's do a little bit of what is metalinguistics and let's bridge through this pretty carefully. Um, <clears throat> metalinguistic awareness is demonstrated when a student exhibits the ability to talk about, to, to talk, think, analyze, and, and do this with language independent of just the basic concrete meaning of each word, that they can cognitively organize it in the brain and manipulate it in a way that they can use their language system as a tool. Like we, you know, we use the illustration of, uh, of, of the bridge, you know, and what, if you just think about all the different ways that you've used bridge before, internal image of a bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge, a certain type of bridge, uh, the, from stories, London Bridge is falling down, or abstract or figurative usage, the bridge between us. My, my father got mad at my mother when they were playing bridge. Ha, ha, ha. Russia is ten. Can you ever bridge the generation yet? When you think about that bridge, and, you know, it always reminds me of when I was asking a child in school, so I gave him a lollipop. I said, take, take a lick of this. He was like a second grader, first grader. And tell me the first word that comes into your mind. He, he, takes, he licks it and he says, sweet. Ah, that's good. So if that fits that, tell me what you thought about the Buckeye victory last weekend. What do you think of that? What word? And he looked at me and he said, sweet. I loved it. I just loved it. Okay, well, sorry. I won't talk about my Buckeyes too much today. All right. So, anyways, metalinguistic skills comprise two areas, really. Um, epilinguistic capacity, which is monitoring of the actual speech production. And, of course, what I talked to you about, metalinguistic awareness. See words as decontextualized objects and to manipulate them and analyze them apart from just their basic meanings. So metalinguistic awareness has its foundation in both semantic, syntactic, and pragmatic competence. And you'll see some of that as we move through this today. So what about meta? How, do, how does meta apply to literacy? And why is it so important in literacy? Well, four areas are really critical for it the connection of metalinguistic. They are reading comprehension, the teaching multiple meanings, and this is really an important one, multiple meanings and the interactions of words and word relationships and how you classify words, how you think about words and the part wholeness of words, how something is composed of various parts or the hierarchy of words, animal, cow, you know, snake, or things like that. And then there's metalinguistic facility, which is essential in the writing process, in initial production and composition and editing, editing. So it's really important. Metalinguistic facility has this to do with how well you actually think with and manipulate your language. And of course, the explicit teaching about language and using language as a tool for literacy development is really key in school, really key. So language disorders and the metalinguistic bridge. We talk about this all the time. You hear I've given ASHA talks. When we talked about it. We gave our last ASHA talk, and it was called, we did a seminar called Paying the Toll at the Metalinguistic Bridge. You know, that paying that toll is happening at the end of second grade or third grade. 
and they got to pay that toll and be able to cross that bridge if they're going to be able to perform at the higher levels of language performance in their school curriculum. Students with language disorders, as it says here, who have received language intervention to establish fundamentals of, of language in the early grades may not have acquired the metalinguistic awareness, and which is in things such as multiple meanings and syntactic flexibility and paraphrasing. And they may perform on the average or low average range, but they still have problems in school. And you, me, and we all, as speech language pathologists, have to totally get this. We need to figure out whether the child we're testing has crossed over the metalinguistic bridge and paid his toll. Can he think with his language system? This is totally one of the most important things. And this is, happens to us a lot with kids who just don't quite qualify. And you see this day, they don't qualify, but they're not meta. And so does that mean we just let them go? I sure hope not. I sure hope not. So metalinguistics and academics, some metalinguistic skills that have an impact on academic performance and social interaction. Well, there's a list of them here. Ability to understand inferences and make prediction, understanding multiple meaning words, using abstract or figurative language, humor, jokes, sarcasm, formulating sentences that meet cultural expectations, the ability to adapt content and structure to match cultural expectations, and resolving incongruities that occur across content and nonverbal expressions or interactions. Very important. Metalinguistics and academics means language is alive and can he manipulate and think through it. Very, very important. So let's take a look at this study. I love this next couple of slides, stages of metalinguistic ability, because we go over this. Like stage one, uh, some things that are meta. They begin to distinguish print from non-print. They know how to interact with books. I mean, a little kid at age two sits and tells stories, knows how to sit and turn the pages and everything, and hold the book up right, to go from left to right. These are good early meta skills. Recognizes some printed symbols that are TV characters. Like, like how about the M for McDonald's? Oh, I bring. I said I show that that a large M to a young kid to a you know McDonald. Stage two. They begin to ascertain word boundaries in spoken sentences and in printed printed sequences. They begin to start self-monitoring themselves in their own speech and to make changes more closely associated with the adult model. They believe that a word is an integral part of the object. The ability to separate words into syllables, we know that that early phonological awareness is an early meta property. The inability to consider, and this is really true, up to age five and a half and six, and six in normal development, that it's hard for kids to consider that one word could have two meanings. The bank is where the money is. It's not the side of a hill. It's not, you know, all the other ways that you could use back a shot in a basketball court, et cetera. They, it's stage three, six to ten is where it all starts to really happen, though. They begin to take the listener's perspective. They understand, they have a better understanding of verbal humor and linguistic ambiguity. They are able to resolve ambiguity and start to do that. Uh, word level first, as in homophones or deep structures. Next, in ambiguous phrases, will you join me in a bowl of soup? Or what do you have if you put three ducks in a box? A box of quackers. Hello. <laughs> and they would get. They start to get those kind of jokes. That's the early metalinguistic ability, and how they start to do it and cross that bridge at eight or nine, where they start to really can use it in school. This is age six to 10 continued. The ability to understand words 
that can have two meanings, one literal and one non-conventional or idiomatic, like I told you before, sweet, where it's like hard, sweet, or bitter. They can, they can begin to see them as having more than one meaning. To resolve sequence elements, I used to do this with Pig Latin. Oh, my God, I won't do it today. I have this terrible urge to do it like I did it as a kid all the time. Ability to segment syllables into phonemes, and they also find it very difficult still at 6 to 10 to deal with the heavy aspects of figurative language. They start to get on the track, but they now really get it until maybe uh, late age 9 or 10 they start to do it. And age 10 plus stages of metalinguistic ability, the ability then after, as, as the cognitive system grows, its ability to think and deal more abstractly, the ability to extend meaning into hypothetical realm, to understand figurative language such as metaphors, similes, and parodies, and analogies, the ability to manipulate various speech styles. All, the, all you ever do is if you can hang around, I saw this a lot, in the fifth and sixth grades and middle school kids when I was just doing, working in schools, how they could they could copy somebody's way of talking and make fun of them. They did a lot of the showing up and making fun of other kids and how they talk and stuff like that. That was, but that was occurred. That was something they could do easily in middle school. So let's move on. Let's take a look at some. I like this too. Meta, some metalinguistic difficulties. Uh, planning for production, let's do some of, some of the planning for production of statements and questions, making predictions, problem solving, self-monitoring, correcting inefficient approaches, recognizing syllable, word, phrase, clause, and sentence boundaries in speech and print, monitoring, self-correcting, editing your speech when you're talking or writing, Editing written, what's not working in the writing, this way is better. Playing with language, but riddles, jokes, rhymes, and especially the ability to analyze and to talk about language. I tried it this way, it didn't work. I did this, it was better. But then I thought, this way works best. When they could start to do that, it's better. But these are really, really common school age metalinguistic difficulties. So what do they need? What are some of their needs? And can you provide to some of these needs? Just think about these for a second. Kids have these kinds of needs. They need more processing time to plan responses. They need you to highlight and explicate the schema, the underlying elements, and scripts that help foster planning and predicting and making hypotheses, does this work or does that work? They, Elizabeth calls metalinguistic language. The, to get at it, you have to do a lot of strategy training to foster planning. Early language intervention is skill-based. Do it right or wrong. Later on, good language intervention is strategy-based, where you teach them to be able to manipulate and think more effectively about it. Think about this language skills versus language strategies. And the strategic approach as they get older is really critical. Practice in self-monitoring and evaluating, identifying where it's not working and breaking down, why goodness. Learning the phonological awareness, of syllabary boundaries and phonemic contrast, and words and clauses and phrases, and to be able to understand what they are and where they are. Practice in playing with various language components, saying words differently, stressing different words, using phrases to inclinate or clauses differently to stress the importance of certain effects. Practice in analyzing, discussing oral and written language, the meaning features of it, what are the most important, what pattern should be listened to, what rules have been used, how this application differs from this application. This is really, truly the superb audience who truly understands how this all works, okay? Very, very, very important. So 
to look at this here. Self-5 metalinguistics, the test objective, major skills assessed, et cetera. Self-5 metalinguistics is a fun thing to talk about, and it focuses on the evaluation of metalinguistic awareness and the ability to talk about, analyze, and think about language. That's really the purpose of the test. Some metalinguistic skills assessed by Self-5 are the ability to get inferences, to deal with understanding inferences, the ability to understand multiple meaning words, the ability to use figurative language and understand humor and sarcasm, and then the ability to formulate spoken and written sentences that meet cultural expectations for conveying meanings and expressing actions or opinions. Now you just look at those things which Self 5 Meta does and just think about how different those properties are from the skill-based standardized test assessments on what they are. And they assess a different functionality in language which kids desperately need in school. So Self 5 Meta is used for kids age 9 to 2111. There's a metalinguistic profile in it. It's kind of like the self profile, okay? So, but it's a meta profile. And then there's a meta, a meta inferences test or subtest. I still call it subtest, but they, they, we still we call them tests now. Meta making inferences, a conversational skills, on multiple meanings, and a figurative language. Those are the four basic tests that are in the self five test of metalinguistics. And then we get some global scores, the, which come as index scores. Now, you're familiar with index scores. You get them on self five. But there is the total metalinguistic index score, which is the total score on the test, and the total metapragmatics test, and the total metasemantics test. Those two properties make up the total metalinguistic score. And this is clearly designed for students who have typically some adequate linguistic knowledge but lack the metalinguistic skills in grades three and up. And that lack of the ability to think and operate systematically is what wears down and they lose their distance and lose their distance at school. Very, very important. Ideal for students with subtle language disorders for students on the autism spectrum. So we're going to talk about now a little bit some cases, okay? And I think that I got this about half done, and I love talking about these cases because I want you to sit back and just enjoy how we go about this in an extremely practical way. In fact, I've given workshops where I talk about cases, and I always workshop ending is called uh, Case Analysis, Let's Get Practical. So let's get practical for a bit today, okay? So this is a case study number one about Kim, a nine-year-old girl. So she would be eligible for the self five test of metalinguistics because she's nine years old. A girl with reading and writing problems and failing grades in language arts and science. I'm sure you know a girl like Kim. Like Kim. Case studies one and two today assess language and communication in context. And we also use the self five ORs. Now, I know you're probably familiar with the self five ORs, the observation scale, but it, the self five ORs um, evaluates a student's communication and language and literacy skills as they are observed in the naturalistic setting of the regular classroom. ORs provides ratings of the frequency of occurrence of behavioral characters associated in the areas of listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And they're on ORS, they're the top 40 classroom issues or problems that deal in the areas of listening, speaking, reading, and writing. There's only 40 items on the checklist. It's only two sides of a sheet of paper, and that's what makes it so spectacular. It means that a teacher or a parent can fill it out right away. We'll look at that, okay? So here's here's a little bit of it of the 
Cell 5 observational range scale. And I think I just only put up the listening component right now. And there's nine areas of listening that are the, the major listening problems that kids have in school. And, they, and so they have a chance to talk about whether they, they occur never or almost ne that, that never or almost never, sometimes, often, always, or almost always. And so they get to check what they are, and then you can check off whether you're the teacher, the parent, or you're the student. Some of the, we let the students themselves, the older kids, take the ORs themselves because they can start to self-analyze this. So I love this, the ORs. It's so practical and simple. It's really ridiculous. The ORs assessment approach, the ORs rating scale checklist, obtains a performance sample, okay, a sample of the kids' classroom performance assessment. But here's what's more important. This performance sample are the things in school that a student struggles to do, to say, to make, and use. Now, I'd like to say that was my idea, but that performed, that I, I learned that from Dr. Jack D'Amico when we worked together in summer school at another university, and I got to tell you that he said, now I really appreciate and admire your tests, but the tests don't tell you the things in school that he struggles to do, say, make, and use. And those are the things that you have to communicate to the parent, to the teacher, and you have to prioritize them because those are the things that have to be improved through the intervention process that you're doing. Or why are you doing it? Holy cow. He made me think. He made me think, and this is exactly what got me going down the classroom assessment pathway. I love my stuff that I've done on self and all the good standardized test work we've done, but the ability then to put them together and to get a view of how this performance compares to the standardized assessment is wonderful. So we obtain this performance sample of a kid. We select then the top 10 problems followed by the top 10 things that a teacher does. We have them circle the top 10 on the, of the 40 items, and then we go to conduct a parent or the teacher, mostly usually the te a teacher interview with, uh, and a classroom observation. We form the teacher interview first, and we get a real good description of that, followed by a classroom inter observation of the speech-language pathologist and a follow-up meeting then with the teacher to focus in on the things that you saw that really works good. When you see the things the teacher is talking about and you look at the eyes of the teacher, it's like, wow, you've connected. This is just fabulous. And so, so what's a performance sample then? It's 30 to, 30 to 50 descriptive examples of performance in school that occur from different activities that maybe occur from different observers or from different contexts. But you get 30 to 50. You get 40 or 50 really good descriptions of the things he struggles to do, say, make, and use. You are on the road to understanding what's wrong in school. And especially compared to the standardized testing you do, you'll start to really see this child differently. So the ORS performance sample, the interview outcomes, we, when we, 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 after we go and con conduct the interview, what we want for sure are the weakness patterns that we know for sure. We want the strength and interest patterns that he's good. He's got anything that he's good at, anything he's interested in. And of course, we want these learning adjustments. And what learning adjustments are for kids are the positive things and the negative things that he does trying to learn. Like the teacher says, oh, every time he gets confused, he raises his hand. Does that help? And I get to help him like that. And negative learning. He's out of his seat, off task, father touches others, touches others, these kinds of things. The negative learning adjustments are the things that drive teachers absolutely crazy. And so they ought to be able to be something that you can zero in on and make sure you know them. So important considerations for ORs. Keep things very practical. Use ORs checklist, only two pages. Complexity, KISS, keep it simple, stupid. That's why the two pages, the top 10, the top 10 things, 
so that you have a link to going in to talk to the teacher and interviewing with the teacher. And then because if you find those things really clearly with the teacher, you have a connection to observation of things that you can actually see what is going wrong in school. Self five ORs is perfect because it allows you to get what I talk about. I've given hundreds of workshops, and the title of the workshop is called A Few Things Done Well. That's what your goal is to do, is to write IEPs and get a team where you've got people focusing on the most important things he struggles to do in school and to get them all on the same pathway. That's a few things done really well. Wow. So what's a few things done well? I said, what is it? Focus on functionality, what he can't do, and improving it. Focus on the most important things, not everything, the things that really can improve him in school. Design intervention with and through others so that you actually do have a team of people from home to other schools to whatever, that you've got more than one person designing and focusing in on a few things he needs to know. You need to put a system in place that works when you're not there. And I think we all as speech language pathologists, especially school clinicians, we know what that means. When it's really working well, we have a system in place that is working when you're not there, not just when you're doing therapy. And you set, and you've got to, and by doing this, you get a chance to know your client, know your student well enough to help them, and allows you then to keep working on gathering data, 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 and more data. This is what I mean by doing a few things really well. So let's take a look at Kim's ORs. Okay, let's just do a few of Kim's ORs. Paying attention. She had problems with paying attention. These are often always on the right. Paying attention, remembering what people say, understanding new ideas. Um, she had problems explaining what was read. These are the items on ORs, always. Identifying the main idea, remembering details, following written directions. And you can see you have the descriptions that fall under each one of these, like explaining what's read, has very little to say, speaks in short comments, only, or won't talk, string sentences, identifies the main, identifying the main, has difficulty thinking of the meaning, struggles to identify word meaning, things like that, things like that. Let's take a look at some more. She has poor grammar, I ran. Writing complete sentences, she often leaves out the subject and verb, she uses fragments, expanding on answers, putting words in the right order, like she said, in winter, when winter is cold, write short and choppy sentences. Never goes to more than three or five words. So, so what we do is we collect all those samples of what the kids say. Now, just take a quick look at this, and you're going to love this, because when you get the handout, you'll love it. It says, here are all the things. There are 36 things on here, and all we did was plays with hands, does not know what to say right after hearing or practicing a concept, struggles to connect ideas. We, we categorize these into listening, speaking, social communication, reading, writing, critical thinking, which is what we call meta a lot, okay? Critical thinking, executive functions, a strength or an interest, whether or not it was something they could do really well or they were really interested in. And then learning adjustment, you can see a non one or a positive, a negative one, it's a negative is a minus or a positive plus. And we put negative learning adjustments in pot or whether it was other. So it has poor reading comprehension, doesn't understand my questions. And we get, we get, what did he get? Yeah. We put them all together. And at the end, well, for, for this female, we had 16 things total in speaking, five in listening, two in social communication, three in reading, seven in writing. Uh, critical thinking, only two, uh, a total of nine, but only two on this part. And executive functions, we had five, and we had nine different kinds of learning adjustments. And of the nine learning adjustments that we had, we had um, only one of them that was really a positive one, okay? So this, the, here's how we do it. And then, and then what we do is we begin sorting it out and putting together all the other teacher comments, and like, 
here's what she said, the student's passive. A student's passive aggressive style in class gives way to more interactive communicating child on the playground. She's really a little more talkative and better out on the playground. She has a small reading vocabulary and struggles to identify words, avoids reading activities, and gains little language growth from reading. Her struggle in reading seems to have made her more passive and participate and doesn't participate in language-based activities. And uh, the teacher is concerned about the student's reading and struggles with poor reading skills, severely limit participate. We, this is what the teacher feels she is ashamed of her reading skills and avoids most experiences. Because reading and writing go hand in hand, her writing skills reflect an overall struggle to become effective. So this is kind of what, this is the way we looked at Kim, okay? So some of the norm reference things on Kim were her core language score was 84. Look at that. You know she's not going to qualify. Just look at these scores. She will not qualify on herself. She will not qualify for anything. But, and so, and then her score, she did have a following directions, a three, the subtest area, look at that. But her, her standard scores, her big scores, is not going to do it, not going to do it. Her WISC, 102, 104, okay? And her working memory, they're low in kids with language disorders a lot. And uh, up here, Kim exhibits basic communication skills with a normal limits on self five. And students with language disorders may have adequate linguistic knowledge and perform in the low average range, but they have not crossed the metalinguistic bridge. So, I mean, here's was here here's was her scores. Here's her scores uh, on um, her test the test of metalinguistic. Seventy two total. Seventy three in meta semantics. When you see her self scores and you compare her meta scores, I have one word for this. D U H. Duh. She has a total language score, 66 to 78 is her confidence interval. I mean, she has meta difficulties, but she's not going to qualify for services if you just use the standard scores on a regular test. So the conclusions of this case study on Kim are we need to do a few things, like to develop knowledge of expressive use of compound and compound sentences for speaking, written language expression, editing and revising. We need to develop conversation and narrative writing skills as they apply to descriptive, expository, and emerging arg argumentative genres. We need to develop awareness of multiple meanings and ambiguities in spoken and written language. And we need to develop this relational knowledge about words to build her semantic properties in the brain so it can connect with working memory and get that meta connection. We need to develop knowledge of idiomatic and figurative language and use in written language. She's on the borderline, but she's going to go downhill and downhill and downhill because she has not paid the toll at the meta linguistic bridge. Well, so let's move on to our last issue today. That's is case number study number two, which is Jack. And Jack, and we're going to go a little more detail on Jack, okay? Jack is a 13-year-old boy with poor study habits, trouble with social communication, written language, critical thinking skills, and has difficulty completing school assignments and turning his work on time. But Jack loves his computer. Do you know a boy named Jack? He loves that computer. So here was his self. Look at this. Look at his scores on self. Again, you know they're borderline except he had one recalling sentences, which is really poor. And uh, when we add all those up and divide by the number of subtests, we have a subtest average of seven, which is one standard deviation below average. So if we take three points lower than seven, we get a recalling sentences. That's an extreme weakness. And we get a 10 on semantic relation, a three. That, these, are, these are the absolute, absolutely sure weakness and sure strength. And the every one is below, borderline low average. So he's not going to qualify this guy here, Jack, unless something else is done. Here's his core language score. <clears throat> his core language score is 80, receptive 88. He's got some other index scores that are kind of like in the moderate range, but his total core score is going to be at 80. And that core score, while it's probably the most sensitive score on self-5, self-5 the most 
sensitive and specific score, most sensitive score, was a standard score of 80, which is the 10th percentile. 90% of kids score higher, but almost all school districts in the country would never qualify this kid because of these standard scores in this range. And so he has, and here's his self five metalinguistics. Look at this, five, three, seven, six. I mean, oh, holy cow. So he, here's his self, here's his self five core scores and all these other ones. Here's his self five metalinguistics scores, conversation skills of three, oh, seven, six, seven. And then let's take a look over here at the total score again. We have a standard score of 73 plus or minus 7. His metapragmatic score is 68, 81 on men. He's got a little bit stronger word memory skills and, and vocabulary skills and stuff like that. But his total meta scores are really, really low, and they're in the moderate to severe range. You, if you do this right, he has a chance to be helped if you look at the meta score. But if you only go on the standard score, and we're talking about self, but if you use other standardized tests, not just self, this is what will happen. He, will, he has a metalinguistic issues. So it is, look at here, look at his, look at his whisk. 93, 108, like 108, 101, 93, all in the average range. And, you know, and again, the working memory score is 90, a low average range. But that happens when you have language and metalinguistic. Usually you have them working memory issues, you know what I mean? So that, that's very, very common. But still, his WIS scores are in the average range. So let's take a look at, here's, here are all the things that we did on his uh, classroom assessment. Take a look at this. Now, I'm going to pass over these things right here first, these things here, because they don't have the check marks. This is because if you wanted to do this at home, you could go through and check it off yourself and put it with check off well, which ones are listening, speaking, social, communication, reading, writing, critical thinking, executive function, strengths or interests, learning adjustment, again, other. Okay? And then we and then you see here here's the the next one, the next one over here, the next page of them. That you can fill this out yourself. And hopefully then you would come up with some scores like this here. And you take a look at he's got very few in this part in listening. Very few that just speaking. Look at this. Social communication, yes, he's got these really horrible here, social communication. Reading, yes, with some writing stuff, critical thinking stuff, executive function stuff, all this, oh, my God, all this stuff. Now, let me just show you over here. And then take a look at, again, listening, speaking, social communication. Uh, and, again, he has uh, critical thinking, executive function. He has a lot of strengths and interests, like, for example, um, um, Axod talks about computers. When he comes up with good ideas, people won't listen. He doesn't try hard enough. He plays baseball and talks a lot about sports, pays attention when he's on the computer, word processes and finds cartoons on the Internet, um, likes a computer but not much else, brings computer games to school, the art teacher thinks he's created, draws pictures of planes and cars, who work on the computer and avoids reading. And he has all these little learning adjustments uh, over here. Uh, like um, he acts odd, talks about computers. Um, he doesn't talk a lot in my class. He seems passive. I know he's bright. Look at his work on the computer. He doesn't try enough in language skills. But when you take a look at his, he has 12 in social communication and Nine in strength and interest, and critical thinking he had six. But now we go back over here. Let's just take a look at some of these, some of these areas. Like his writing contains a number of tense and pronoun errors. Short, repetitive written sentences make little sense. Writing is hard to read because it's so small with deformed letters. Very few links between written sentences. No conjunctions. Oh my God, no conjunctions. Can't make complex sentences without conjunctions. He doesn't seem to build up and break down sentences well in writing. His communication with teachers is negative and abrupt. Oh, my God. Let me try this John, down at the end out here. He doesn't have good study skills, gets lost, doesn't follow directions. He doesn't know where the study questions are. He doesn't finish what he starts, gets lost, turns off during lectures, doesn't recognize his, his stuff, his errors in writing. Um, 
over here. Let's see. Let's 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 go over here to social things. He's hard to have a conversation with. He acts odd. Talks about computers. It takes him too long to make sense. He rarely socializes. He doesn't talk a lot in my class. He seems passive, uninterested in what other people do. Just think about all these issues that his kid has. Now watch this. This is what really I took this here, and then we just we we this is for you to look at later. Okay, we took all these listening, speaking, the same things as before, and all we did is we now charted them, which ones were in listening, which ones okay all over, so that you could see how they combine and fall into multiple areas. But take a look at the primary problem: social communication. Look at that. A lot of those so lot of social communication problems. And then over here, a lot of writing, a lot of critical thinking stuff, and this is the meta properties. And then a lot of these executive functions of stuff about how he manages himself in learning, in learning processes in school. Doesn't remember character names, sloppy note taker, rarely completes assignments, doesn't have good study skills, gets lost. He doesn't know where the study questions are, doesn't finish what he starts gets lost and turns off during life. Oh, my word. Just think about what a problem he is. And so when I go over here, there's another. And then we put strengths and interests. We added all those up. Learning adjustments, learning adjustments, which rarely volunteers to talk, acts odd, talks about computers. Like this. And then summary. We, we felt the summary was that he had problems with study skills, social communication skills, some with literacy, some with critical thinking, metalinguistic, metacognitive, motivation and responsibility, organization, organization and planning, knowledge of computers, and good visual, good art design, word processing. So, interesting. So here's what we did. Here were the areas that we came up with in with Jack. He had problems with study skills. Now this is summarizing. Completing assignments, turning work on. Literacy, reading and writing. Social communication. Motivation and responsibility. Critical thinking, meta skills. And sense of competence, believing in himself. These were the areas, and here's where they showed up. Okay? We went and we met with the middle school teachers because we had collected this data from the middle school teachers, mostly the English teacher and another teacher. But we got this, and we met with all the middle school teachers, and we said, this is Jack. Study skills, completing assignments, literacy, look at that. Social communication skills, these were things that were just on the, on the classroom assessment, poor at reading, things that we got out of, of where we interviewed the teachers. Motivation and responsibility, look at this. Passive, avoid school motivation, social communication skills, metalinguistic critical thinking, and sense of competence. Now, I've got to tell you what a couple of the teachers said to us. They looked at this sheet that was all about Jack, his six areas that he has problems, and examples of the school behaviors that fit these areas. And two of the teachers said, this is incredible. This is Jack. You know, you know we've had meetings like this before, but they usually only give us test scores. <laughs> I know there's some clinicians who only do that. They gave them, he, the clinicians who did this, this evaluation painted a perfect picture of the, his main areas of struggle in school and gave specific examples. And then we let the teachers meet, get this. Here's the revised list of performance patterns following input from the middle school teachers. Now, you'll look at this and you'll say, this is the middle school input. He said the number one problem this kid has is completing and finishing his work, turning work in end time, remembering things, or produces work that's neat in appearance, talks and organizes, and takes useful notes. Social communication, adopts a positive attitude, relates more effectively with peers and teachers, volunteers information, responds effectively in class. And then Literacy, writes clearer sentences, establishes more meaningful links, recognizes it. And they said, yeah, some a couple of meta things they said, developing a broader understanding of word meanings, motivation and responsibility, adopting a more positive attitude, 
but they look at look at how they focused primarily on the, on these areas: study skills and social communication skills, and early literacy, and these other meta skills. But these were the things that they came up with, and things like that. This was this was Jack's present levels of performance, the summary made up on him from the evaluation done using the ORs and the META. But just think, this was done with the ORs, the, the, the top 10, the interviews, the working with this and collecting the data and put, placing, finding the, what he struggles to do, say, make, and use in school. This is it. And listen to this. Now, you tell me about this present levels of performance description of Jack. Jack is an eighth grade student in Washington Hunt Middle School. Standardized assessment indicates the following. Receptive and expressive language performance in the marginal educational range. Metalinguistic skills that fall in the low to very low educational range. Classroom-based assessment suggests four performance patterns in two related areas that limit academic success reduce his participation in school and affect his sense of competence as a learner. These patterns in order of concern are planning and organizational skills that negatively impact study habits. Social communication and social skills which limit classroom participation and negatively impact affect Jack's relationship with teachers and peers. Written language skills, the writing process itself, as well as editorial skills, and metalinguistic skills which limit critical thinking and analysis in several subject areas. Jack sets a competence as a learner, willingness to participate actively in school, and motivation to improve pose major barriers for all teachers. These four areas require targeted instruction and support, but Jack has considerable potential given his artistic strengths, knowledge of computers, and interest in sports. These strengths and interests exist in the presence of average to possibly above average intelligence. So what do you think of that? What do you think of that? Is that amazing? Just think about what he struggles to do, say, make, and use. And we came up then with, finally, in our last two minutes, our top 10 classroom assessment lists. They are number 10. What the student struggles to do, say, make, and use. I want you to think and use those concepts and talk about those things with teachers. Focus on different procedures, context, and skills. Use rating scales, checklists, observation, and interviewing. Keep it simple, stupid. Begin by focusing on the top 10 things in school. Keep it simple down there and start by building on those things first and then spreading it. Get a rich performance sample by doing the top 10 and talking to the teacher. Weakness patterns, strengths and interests, learning adjustments. And then shared responsibility, clarification, problem solving, and listening. Oh, well, wait a minute. Number three is the same. Listening, problem solving, clarification, shared responsibility. Isn't that important? You need to do those things. Shared responsibility for things, clarification so you know what's wrong, problem solving so you know who's going to do what, and listening, good, good, top-notch listening skills. And then, most importantly, establish an academic endpoint for school. Establish an academic endpoint. Show them that there's a reason for doing it. Focus on a few things and do these things really well. Paying the toll at the bridge, classroom performance, and team-based practice. Thank you. It's exactly 2 o'clock. Thank you very much for listening to me and putting up with all my elaborations and all my things. But I think you can tell I love this topic and love this subject more than anything else, and it has equipped me and we've equipped speech-language pathologists like we have never done before with the ability to think beyond just the standardized test scores and to look at the person and to begin to 